Jessica Gaines, and I serve as the program coordinator at Green Acre, which is a Baha'i center of learning here in Elliott, Maine, which is the ancestral homeland of the Wapanaki people. Like other institutions, we're closed, but we're open. <laughs> uh, we're having many more programs now than we, than we did before, you know, before COVID, and we're able to reach so many more people, and for that, we're very grateful, even though, of course, this is a quite, quite the difficult time. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about Green Acre, I just need to acknowledge uh, Louise, Louise Prophet LeBlanc. We're so glad and honored to have her here, and I will tell you a little bit more about her in a second. So if this is your first time uh, attending a program at Green Acre, let me tell you just a little bit about us. We, hosts, we host programs, used to be in person and now online, that focus on the nobility of the human spirit, that focus on resilience and racial justice and unity. And we've been having these conversations since the late 1800s. We are a faith-based organization centered on the teachings of Baha'u'llah and the message that the oneness of humanity is a strength that we can all unite around for the advancement of civilization. And we learn to, we aim to learn and cooperate and transform society alongside you. Um, I wanna give you just a little bit of info about how to engage with us today. If you move your cursor around, you will see a little chat icon at the bottom bar of your screen. Feel free to chat away with us. We can read what you say. Um, Sheila Dean asks, are we muted? Yes, everyone is muted. As this is a webinar, we have too many participants, unfortunately, for this to be a, a Zoom meeting, so we've had to move it to a webinar. But we can read what you send us. So please, um, you know, you can say hi to everybody. And at the end, there will be a time for Q&A. And there is a separate Q&A box at the bottom screen, at the bottom of your screen. Please do put your questions in there because sometimes we get going, we get really engaged, we type a lot in the chat box. And if you put a question in there, I can miss it. So please put questions for the end in the Q&A box, which the icon is, is down there as well next to that chat box. And with that, I would love to um, introduce our, our, our wonderful speaker, uh, Louise Prophet LeBlanc. Louise is a traditional storyteller from the Nacho Nyakdan First Nation of the Yukon Territory in Northern Canada. Her 30 year commitment to the cultural and artistic heritage of her people includes being co-founder of two seminal organizations of the Yukon, the Yukon International Storytelling Festival and the Society of Yukon Artists of Native Ancestry. Both of these organizations helped to inspire an artistic revival and recognition of indigenous art in the territory. Louise worked for several years as the Yukon Native Heritage Advisor for the Yukon government, recording traditional stories relative to Yukon geographical place names. She pays tribute to the many elders she was privileged to work with for over a decade, ensuring these precious stories are captured for future generations. Louise worked for over 11 years to help advance Aboriginal art in Canada through her position at Canada Council for the Arts where she served as coordinator for the Aboriginal Arts Office in Strategic Initiatives. Despite her full-time employment at Canada Council, Louise continued to respond to requests from regional and local Aboriginal gatherings, festivals, and inner city school programs, sharing traditional stories and providing a framework of curriculum for teachers to use in their classes. She was also privileged to be invited as a storyteller at international venues, including Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Greenland, Scotland, the US, Belize, and Hawaii, and at many national indigenous artistic gatherings. So Louise uh, gets around and has a lot of experience and has a lot of folks asking for her to share. So we are very grateful that she agreed to come and share with all, all of us today. And with that, I will pass it over to Louise. Hello, friends. I'm so happy to be here with you tonight, Indian Dohoti. Uh, last evening, my husband and I um, decided that we would prepare a ceremony for this evening and call on all our ancestors to help us to understand our important role in, bring about, in bringing about unity. And so with that, we have to have a greater understanding 
of what reconciliation is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the screen and uh, I'm going to um, take you on a little ceremony with us. Friends, we're going to have a little ceremony this evening for tomorrow's presentation. And we're going to light a smudge, going to light some sage to bring a blessing so that we can all learn about the seven valleys of Baha'u'llah and how if we traverse these seven valleys, we will come to a condition of reconciling all our differences. The first precious valley is the valley of search. The second valley is the valley of love. The third valley of our journey is the valley of knowledge. Fourth valley is the valley of unity. Fifth valley is the valley of contentment. Our sixth valley is a valley of wonderment. We have traversed all six valleys. We come to the last valley on our journey to reconciliation. And this is the valley of true poverty and absolute nothingness.
friends, with that ceremony, because of our moment of reflection and quiet, I'd like to stay in the quiet for a minute because this is the 19th year since the tragedy of 9-11 happened in New York City. And um, I'd just like to have us together in prayer and remember all of those souls that left our, our planet on that day and um, how in that year so many people came together and recognized our oneness and helping each other. So I'll just time it and uh, we can just say prayers for all the families and for those that have gone on. I'm just going to say a prayer in my language to remember my own ancestors and the Northern Toshone people in Northern Canada and the Yukon Territory. And this is a, a poignant prayer for this evening because inevitably with the usage of technologies, we have our difficulties. And this is uh, in the Nacho Nayak Dan First Nation language. Remover of difficulties. Ayere cho tauringi, ayere cho tauringi deo di gano, Sultan. And my dear sister here has agreed to be part of this devotional aspect of our evening together and she's uh, offered or at least she's agreed to offer us a song for this evening as well. Thank you, Jessica. My pleasure, my honor. Thank you for asking. <clears throat> he who is your Lord, the all-merciful, he who is your Lord, the all-merciful, cherisheth in his heart the desire of beholding, cherisheth in his heart the desire of beholding the entire human race, the entire human race. The entire human race, the entire human race, as one soul and one body, as one soul and one body, he who is your Lord, the all-merciful, he who is your Lord, the all-merciful, cherisheth in his heart the desire of beholding, cherisheth in his heart the desire of beholding the entire human race, the entire human race. The entire human race, the entire human race has one soul and one body, as one soul and one body, as one soul and one body, as one soul and one body.
So here's the title page. And I've asked my sister, uh, Jessica, to help me with the reading. Um, I was expecting a Zoom, you know, usually on Zoom, everybody helps, they read, and it's nice to have many voices. And so this first image here is a valley in the Yukon. This is in the Ogilvy Mountain Range. And this is uh, my ancestral home in the territory. So tonight, friends, we're going to be taking a little journey together. And I entitled this The Seven Valleys Towards Reconciliation. And those little lamps that you saw in the ceremony, it's interesting that my art inspired me to understand more clearly that truly reconciliation does not have to be as difficult as we might think it. And in my, my studies, I recognize that, of course, Baha'u'llah has given us, he's given us the teaching of how to move through until we get to absolute nothingness. So what begins is total disunity, total misunderstandings or lack of understanding. He takes us through these valleys. Louise, could you explain just very briefly what the Seven Valleys is? The Seven Valleys are the most mystical writings of Baha'u'llah. And he wrote them for a judge who at that time, I believe, was also, um, I guess it came from the Sufi mystical teachings. And so it's based on that style of um, writing. So he says that, well, actually, Abdul Baha said this is a guide to the way we should live our lives. This is what he makes reference to uh, the Seven Valleys. So I thought that was a pretty good place to start. Thank you. Yes. So at the very top, you know, I think oftentimes, <clears throat> at least myself, I, I, I feel, you know, the world is so challenging today. But Baha'u'llah keeps reminding us of who we are as believers in the most recent revelation to the planet. He said, ye, talking to you, talking to me, talking to all of humanity, he said, ye are the stars of the heaven of understanding, the breeze that stirreth at the break of day, the soft flowing waters upon what what must depend the very life of all men, the letters inscribed upon his sacred scroll. And he says, with the most utmost unity and in a spirit of perfect fellowship, exert yourselves, that ye may be enabled to achieve that which beseemeth this day of God. So Bahala was referring to this is the most glorious day. The revelation of Bahala is encompassed the entire planet. And it all got started in the last century, in 1844, with the first revelation of the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, the Bab. And so that's how many years that this planet of ours has been affected by this continuous flowing of these soft flowing waters. He said, verily I say strife and dissension, and whatever the mind of man abhorreth, are entirely unworthy of his station. And this is taken from gleanings from the writings of Baha'u'llah. Now, one of the things uh, that we realize that in order to serve humanity, we cannot do it by ourselves. Definitely, we cannot do it without God's help. And service in love for mankind is unity with God. And he who serves has already entered the kingdom and is seated on the right hand of his Lord. Do you want to read the next one, please, Jessica? Sure thing. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, it's on there. This is the day. It's just changing now. I think there's a, I think it's a bit delayed. 
the day. Okay. That's right. This is the day in which God's most excellent favors have been poured out upon men. The day in which his most mighty grace hath been infused into all created things. It is incumbent upon all the peoples of the world to reconcile their differences and with perfect unity and peace abide beneath the shadow of the tree of his care and loving kindness. Baha'u'llah. So I must confess that when the whole process of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was established in Canada in 2013, is when it first um, began its journey, I had no idea what reconciliation was. I didn't understand that just to reconcile our differences is, I, I understood that concept, but to reconcile between the government and to those people who have been impacted by residential schools. So this was a new word to the indigenous community, this reconcile. Prior to that, I think the only thing I reconcile was my checks and balances at the bank. <laughs> so, Baha'u'llah tells us, we must reconcile these differences. I was so moved by this photograph. The first time I saw this was in the Holy Land at the mansion in Masre. And for those people that don't know this, this is the first all Indian local spiritual assembly in the Americas, established in 1948 on the Omaha Indian Reservation at Macy, Nebraska. These people are our ancestors, all of our ancestors. And these people, if we look at this photograph, we know that they too are assisting us with coming to a higher understanding of how to build unity. Yeah, I love the greatest name right in the center. It's so beautiful. Now for people that don't know this beautiful couple, I encourage you to read a book of which you will be taken also on a journey of reconciliation. This is Melba and Jim Loft. And Melba and Jim Loft were the first Indigenous Canadian believers. She was Algonquin, Ishnabekwe, and he was Haudenosaunee. And it was very unusual at that time for these two nations to marry. So there's a book, it's called Return to Tyandanega. Now I should say that Jim was an excellent mechanic. And this was in 1938. And Melba was a secretary. And they decided to moved to Detroit. They became city dwellers. And Melba met her neighbor and her neighbor introduced her to the Baha'i faith. And it wasn't long before Jim was curious as well, but he was not a Baha'i. Eventually he did embrace this faith. And he looked around and he saw their lives. And he realized that they were living materially very well. But he was very concerned about the people back home who lived in utmost poverty. So he asked Melba to write to the guardian. I want you to write to Shoghi Effendi 
because Jim was somewhat illiterate. Like he, I think he had a grade seven or eight education and he just wanted a perfect letter for his beloved guardian. Melba refused. And she said, it's because I knew what the answer would be. So he got his neighbor to write the letter. He sent it off to the guardian, to Shogi Fendi. And the letter came back, returned to Tyendinaga. I encourage you to read the book. They suffered tremendously on the reserve. Here is a grown man. He wanted to become self-sufficient in order to provide for his family. And he could not get a loan from the bank. In those days, Native people could not get a loan. And apparently they used to have wonderful firesides at their home. And a young man who was a poet later on in his life, Roger White, I'm sure many people know who this man was. He was just fresh out of school. He had just graduated from high school. And when he found out this dilemma that Jim was facing, he said, I will come with you and I will co-sign. Because he was a white man, he could do that. And so that's how they got going with their business there. So I'm going to share a few writings now from Shogi Fendi, where he's making reference to teaching Indigenous people and how important that is. So Jessica, would you kindly read this uh, first writing from Shogi Fendi? It was written in 1950. Sure thing. And for folks who may not know, Shogi Fendi was called the guardian of the Baha'i faith. That was the station um, that he occupied. Um, and he was the grandson of Abdul Baha, who was the son of Baha'u'llah. The work being done by various Baha'is, including our dear Indian believer who returned from the United States in order to pioneer amongst his own people in teaching the Canadian Indians, is one of the most important fields of activity under your jurisdiction. The Guardian hopes that ere long, many of these original Canadians will take an active part in Baha'i affairs and arise to redeem their brethren from the obscurity and despondency into which they have fallen. Thanks for informing us about Shoghi Fendi, referred to also as the guardian. Shoghi Fendi was the grandson of Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha actually came to America in 1912. And came to Greenacre. And he came to Greenacre. And he went as far as California. He also came to Montreal in Canada where he lived at May and Sutherland Maxwell's home. And Shoghi Fendi, again, he, he makes mention about the importance of teaching the original inhabitants of North America, who of course were the Aboriginal people. It says Shoghi Fendi is also most anxious for the message to reach the Aboriginal inhabitants of the Americas. These people, for the most part, downtrodden and ignorant, should receive from the Baha'is a special measure of love and every effort be made to teach them. Their enrollment in the faith will enrich them and us and demonstrate our principle of the oneness of man far better than words or the wide conversion of the ruling races ever can. Jessica. O oh, son of man, my calamity is my providence. 
Outwardly, it is fire and vengeance, but inwardly, it is light and mercy. Hasten thereunto, that thou mayest become an eternal light and an immortal spirit. This is my command unto thee. Do thou observe it. Baha'u'llah. And this is taken from a, a book of stanzas, a book of thoughts that are world embracing, very spiritually profound into brevity. Um, Baha'u'llah has taken them and given these teachings to us, these spiritual um, uh, guidance to us in brevity in what is called the hidden words so that this is a book that anybody that is interested they can probably access that now this photograph here is taken at the museum of history in ottawa over a year and a half ago when many women um, got together and provided a document documenting all of the atrocities that have happened to indigenous women. And these women are missing and presumed murdered. And so all the people came to witness this um, report and also uh, to receive these beautiful little booklets that would help people to become more aware, more conscientious and how to help the families, but also to prevent this from being carried, carried on in the community. So I thought that this quote from Abdul Baha, who's the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, he said, be a refuge to the fearful bring ye rest and peace to the disturbed make ye a provision for the destitute be a treasury of riches for the poor be a healing medicine for those who suffer pain be doctor and nurse to the ailing promote ye friendship and honor and conciliation and devotion to god in this world of non-existence. Again, friends, we find that word, conciliation, which is a root word of reconciliation. Now, this one is taken from the Seven Valleys as well. And I think I'm going to ask um, the singer, Jessica, to read this one. Sure thing. Oh, my friend, listen with heart and soul to the songs of the Spirit, and treasure them as thine own eyes. For the heavenly wisdoms, like the clouds of spring, will not rain down on the earth of men's hearts forever. And through the grace of the all-bounteous one, oh, and through the grace of the all-bounteous, one is never stilled and never ceasing. Yet to each time and era, a portion is allotted and a bounty set apart, this in a given measure. So as I was saying before, the master, this is another term that we use, another um, very, um, what I would call a precious title for Abdul Baha, and this was written on behalf of Shoghi Fendi, but he said, he attaches the greatest importance to this matter as the master has spoken of the latent strength of character of these people and feels that when the spirit of the faith has a chance to work in their midst, it will produce remarkable results. And this is the actual quote um, from Abdul Baha again. I'm not sure if Abdul Baha 
It was never recorded when he visited America if he met any indigenous people. I know that he definitely met black people and he met um, for sure at Green Acre, he met people from India, the Swamis, and he met other spiritual leaders. But there's nothing that has been written as far as I know about him encountering, but because he was such a spiritually um, mature and you know, he, he really had a special position within the faith. I'm sure he felt the spirit of the indigenous people of the Americas. So the master has likened the Indians in your countries to the early Arabian nomads at the time of the appearance of Muhammad. Within a short period of time, they became the outstanding examples of education, of culture, and of civilization for the entire world. The master feels that similar wonders will occur today if the Indians are properly taught and if the power of the spirit properly enters into their living. I'm already beginning to see how over the last 20 years there are so many indigenous educators in universities, in communities, uh, revival of language, revival of ancient culture practices, and certainly with the teachings, um, they are assisting in the civilization of people they come in contact with. I, I, I witnessed that. Okay, Jessica. Soon is it? Oh, so I'll read it. Wow, I'm sorry. All right. Oh, there it goes. Nor should any of the pioneers at this early stage in the upbuilding of Baha'i national communities overlook the fundamental prerequisite for any successful teaching enterprise which is to adapt the presentation of the fundamental principles of their faith to the cultural and religious backgrounds, the ideologies and the temperament of the diverse races and nations whom they are called upon to enlighten and attract. The susceptibilities of these races and nations differing widely in their customs and standards of living should at all times be carefully considered and under no circumstances neglected. Well, I'm sure that when the first Baha'is taught the indigenous people, it must have been a wonderful moment because as far as I know, in many of the nations, the first nations, many of the tribes, um, they all know that this time was coming, that all peoples of the world within the medicine wheel would come to their shores. And they knew that there would be a great teacher who would bring about this oneness. They've always believed that we are one, one family, no matter what our color is, no matter where we come from. This is our mother here, the earth, and so therefore we are all part of the same family. So. I'm sure that when the early Baha'is shared this with the indigenous people, they, they probably said, yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is what we already believe. Abdul Baha said, be a refuge to the fearful bring ye rest and peace to the disturbed, make ye a provision for the destitute, be a treasury of riches for the poor, be a healing medicine for those who suffer pain, be doctor and nurse to the ailing, promote ye friendship and honor 
and conciliation and devotion to God in this world of non-existence. You're up next, please, Jessica. This is another hidden word. O oh, son of spirit, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes, and not through the eyes of others, and shalt know of thine own knowledge and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. Ponder this in thy heart, how it behooveth thee to be. Verily justice is my gift to thee, and the sign of my loving kindness. Set it then before thine eyes. And as we all know, the purpose of justice is to attain unity. Baha'u'llah says, the light of men is justice. Quench it not with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny. The purpose of justice is the appearance of unity among men. Now, as I referred to previously, there was established in Canada a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to uncover, to record, to acknowledge all of the, I believe the number was over a hundred years, because it started in the late 1800s, where children were removed from their communities and their families. I believe the number was 150,000 children removed from their parents and their land and their way of being and put into these schools. So eventually there was enough um, consultation with many uh, government agencies that in order for the people of Canada to heal, the Indigenous people to heal, their stories had to be heard. And so they established a commission to bring this out people to see, for people to be able to be informed and educated. I've often thought about that quote from Abdul Baha and I thought to myself, perhaps this, this is part of that educated, that the people are educating others in knowing the truth. And this is a beautiful part of the Truth and Reconciliation submission from the NSA of Canada, which was presented in September 2013. And it's only been four years since the final recommendations have been made in Canada about all of these testimonies. And if you wish to um, do more research in this and, and find out and search for your own truth, you can simply go to uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. There's a lot on the internet about it. So the National Spiritual Assembly of Canada indicates this. The process of reconciliation is aided by magnanimity on the part of all concerned perpetrators victims, and even newcomers 
all in Canada who have learned to live together. Without forgetting the injustices of the past, we need a sense of solidarity and resolve as we face the present and the future together. This may be helped by expressions of forgiveness on the part of the victims, although no one has the, re has the right to require this. Without erasing the memories of past injustice and pain, forgiveness can be a gesture of magnanimity and resilience that reinforces the nobility and courage of those who have suffered. It requires engaging with one another in a spirit of selfless love, where misunderstandings are overcome through patient and respectful dialogue, and cultural differences provide an occasion to learn from one another. We certainly can understand that more clearly when we will read the whole passage from the seven valleys when we enter the valley of love. And I encourage you to find this book also online. It's, it's an engaging read. So Bahá'u'lláh says that we must shut our eyes to estrangement, then fix your gaze upon unity. Rather, our hearts should burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. So friends, we're going to enter now into each of the different valleys. And if there are any burning questions, because I can't see them, <laughs> My helper, uh, Jessica, is um, over there. Yes. And if people have any questions in between, just please put the questions there. And I know that we're going to have time to have more conversation at the end. But if, if you like, you could even say, can I ask the question now? But um, I don't know what the time is, so... <laughs> Welcome to this journey. It's a, it's, it's a journey that we take probably every moment of our lives. We can go through these seven valleys in one breath, one moment, one minute, one day, one year, one month. We can go through all of these valleys and then ultimately come around. So throughout our lives, throughout our day, throughout our hour that we're in right now, we're in some sort of search. So the first valley is the valley of search. And this first writing is from the Kitab Iran, which is another uh, text that was written by Baha'u'llah. When he's talking about the importance of all of us searching for our own truth. We must not depend on somebody else's truth. We must investigate truth for ourselves. So um, Jessica, would you please read the first quote here under the Valley of Search? Only when the lamp of search, of earnest striving, of longing desire, of passionate devotion, of fervid love, of rapture and ecstasy is kindled within the seeker's heart and the breeze of his loving kindness is wafted upon his soul. Will the darkness of error be dispelled, the mists of doubts and misgivings be dissipated and the lights of knowledge and certitude envelop his being. Now, Shoghi Effendi also talks about this search. He said, the more we search for ourselves, the less likely we are to find ourselves. The more we search for God and to serve our fellow man, 
the more profoundly will we become acquainted with ourselves and the more inwardly assured. He said also that this is one of the greatest spiritual laws of life. We slip into the valley of knowledge in our search. We search everywhere. There's a beautiful story about, it's a Persian story and it was about Majnun. He was in that valley of search. He was so in love with Laili. And he searched for truth even in the dust. That's another story that is also contained within the full compilation of the Seven Valleys. So the Valley of Knowledge, I think this is very appropriate for reconciliation because we've been asked to educate ourselves. What is reconciliation? And we have to search in our own minds, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to my family? What does that mean in my community, my nation? And what does it mean in the world? So Abdul Baha says that God has created in man a power of reason, whereby man is enabled to investigate reality. God has not intended man to blindly imitate his fathers and ancestors. He has endowed him, whoops, he has endowed him with a, I can't see that, oh, with mind or the faculty of reasoning by the exercise of which he is to investigate and discover the truth. And that which he finds real and true, he must accept. He must not be an imitator or a blind follower of any soul. He must not rely implicitly upon the opinion of any man without investigation. Nay, each soul must seek intelligently and independently, arriving at a real conclusion and bound only by that reality. I just heard a quote the other day from the Hia Khanum, who was Abdu Baha's sister. And she, her quote was that there's two signs of true resilience. And one is just that, that we are able to recognize our own reality and that we can solve the unsolvable. That's truly resilience. Well, those are the two aspects that we know our reality and solve the unsolvable. Okay, you have another hidden word to read, my friend. O oh, son of spirit, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes, and not through the eyes of others, and shalt know of thine own knowledge, and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. Ponder this in thy heart, how it behooveth thee to be. Verily justice is my gift to thee, and the sign of my loving kindness. Set it then before thine eyes. I really appreciate when Baha'u'llah says, ponder this. I think so with everything that's going on in the world, you know, people are looking at justice, not with a desire to attain unity, and so he really encourages us to ponder this in our hearts. 
how we should be. And how wonderful he says that his, this is a gift to us. And it's a sign of kindness. So God has given us eyes that we may look around the world and lay hold on whatsoever will further civilization and the arts of living. He has given us ears that we may hear and profit by the wisdom of scholars and philosophers and arise to promote and practice it. Senses and faculties have been bestowed upon us to be devoted to the service of the general good so that we distinguished above all other forms of life for perceptiveness and reason should labor at all times and along all lines. Whether the occasion be great or small, ordinary or extraordinary until all mankind are safely gathered into the impregnable stronghold of knowledge. We should continually be establishing new bases for human happiness and cre creating and promoting new instrumentalities towards this end. And this is taken from a book of the secret of divine civilization. I think there's so many people in the world that are so disenchanted with their governing bodies. I think this would be a good book for them to read. <laughs> Takes it to a whole new level. I'm the sun of wisdom and the ocean of knowledge. I cheer the faint and revive the dead. I'm the guiding light that illumineth the way. I am the royal falcon on the arm of the almighty and I unfold the drooping wings of every broken bird and start it on its flight. I think what I've witnessed uh, in Canada since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report in many communities that I had the opportunity to visit before COVID hit, <laughs> And even post-COVID, you know, I'm keeping in touch uh, online, is that there are many drooping wings that have been opened in the communities. The, the information, the knowledge, uh, the testimonies that have come out have brought about a healing amongst the indigenous populations. It seems to be a time of, yes, great healing and growth in the indigenous community. People are starting to believe in themselves again. Would you like to read the top one, please, Jessica? Sure thing. Make every effort to acquire the advanced knowledge of the day and strain every nerve to carry forward the divine civilization. Abdul Baha. So friends, we're still in the valley of knowledge. We're looking around and we're trying to find what is, what is the knowledge that I need in order to be of assistance to this establishment of a new civilization, a civilization that is a divine civilization. One in which every human being on the planet has a place and everyone can share knowledge with each other and support each other. And the religion of God is a promoter of truth the establisher of science and learning. So just going back to, you know, should they be educated? I keep thinking about this to myself as an indigenous person. 
What does that education mean? The established, the establisher of science and learning, the supporter of knowledge, the civilization, the civilized, the civilizer of the human race, the discoverer of the secrets of existence, and the enlightener of the horizons of the world. How then could you it oppose the knowledge? God forbid. On the contrary, in the sight of God, knowledge is the greatest human virtue and the noblest human perfection. To oppose knowledge is pure ignorance, and he who abhors knowledge and learning is not a human being, but a mindless animal. That's pretty strict, <laughs> Abdu Baha. For knowledge is light, life, felicity, perfection, and beauty, and causes the soul to draw nigh to the divine threshold. It is the honor and glory of the human realm and the greatest of God's bounties. I was so taken by this quote, knowledge is identical to guidance and ignorance is the essence of error. So without knowledge, we can't guide ourselves through life. Okay. We're going to fall into the valley of love. Now, for those people that would like to read this beautiful book, I'm, I'm sure that they probably have, for local people that live in the Green Acre area, I'm sure that they could borrow a book. And the book would be the seven valleys. And it's so sweet because he said, this deed of this valley is pain. And it's so interesting that you would think that love is just all nice, very easy. But no, you have to work to find true love. So maybe you'll read the first paragraph, please, Jessica. Thank you. In the world of existence, there is indeed no greater power than the power of love. When the heart of man is aglow with the flame of love, he is ready to sacrifice all, even his life. The message of the holy divine manifestations is love. The phenomena of creation are based upon love. The radiance of the world is due to love. The well-being and happiness of the world depend upon it. Therefore, I admonish you that you must strive throughout the human world to diffuse the light of love. The people of this world are thinking of warfare. You must be peacemakers. The nation are self-centered. The nations are self-centered. You must be thoughtful of others rather than yourselves. They are neglectful. You must be mindful. They are asleep. You should be awake and alert. May each one of you be as a shining star in the horizon of eternal glory. It's so interesting that during the COVID period, that people are starting to understand that love is the imperative, that love is the light, that caring for people, showing compassion. Actually, people that never ever said that they love me are actually saying, I love you. So it's interesting how God works and this is a very powerful valley that we're, we're in right now. Okay, take it away, Jessica. I charge you all that each one of you concentrate all the thoughts of your heart on love and unity. When a thought of war comes, oppose it by a stronger thought of peace. A thought of hatred must be destroyed by a more powerful thought of love. Thoughts of war bring destruction to all harmony. 
well-being, restfulness, and content. Thoughts of love are constructive of brotherhood, peace, friendship, and happiness. If you desire with all your heart friendship with every race on earth, your thought, spiritual and positive, will spread. It will become the desire of others, growing stronger and stronger until it reaches the minds of all men. Friends, that's the promise. That's the promise of Abdul Baha. So when there are thoughts of destruction, thoughts of peace, is uh, the war, thought of enemies and sadness, we have to think the opposite. We have to become the opposite. That's in Paris Talks, which is a book that Abdu Baha, of all of his talks when he was in Paris, he gave many talks to the community and showered the teachings upon those people. Now here's another um, phenomenon that I remember when I, when I first started to understand science and chemistry and I heard this chemist say that there's this magic little thing within the molecular theories and they didn't know what to call it so they called it love. <laughs> it holds it all together and we've known this from the teachings of, of the faith that everything is being held together through this love. When we observe the phenomena of the universe, we realize that the axis around which life revolves is love. While the axis around which death and destruction revolve is animosity and hatred. The proof is clear that in all degrees and kingdoms, unity and agreement, love and fellowship are the cause of life. Love and fellowship are the cause of life. Whereas dissension, animosity and separation are ever conducive to death. Therefore, we must strive with life and soul in order that day by day, unity and agreement may be increased amongst mankind and that love and affinity may become more resplendently glorious and manifest. Just recently, the Universal House of Justice, which is the elective, elected administrative body of the Baha'i world, whose seat is in Israel, in Haifa, Israel, wrote a beautiful letter to all of the Baha'is of the world and their friends. And this is a letter of which they referred to love. And I want you to read that beautiful paragraph, please, Jessica. Ultimately, the power to transform the world is affected by love. Love originating from the relationship with the divine. Love ablaze among members of a community. Love extended without restriction to every human being. This divine love ignited by the word of God is disseminated by enkindled souls through intimate conversations that create new susceptibilities in human hearts, open minds to moral persuasion, and loosen the hold of biased norms and social systems so that they can gradually take on a new form in keeping with the requirements of humanity's age of maturity. You are channels for this divine love. Let it flow through you to all who cross your path. Infuse it into every neighborhood and social space in which you move to build capacity to canalize the society building power of Baha'u'llah's revelation. There can be no rest until the destined outcome is achieved. I don't know about the other um, Baha'is that are there, but I felt so assured, you know, this was just written in July. And of course, with all of the concerns around the COVID pandemic and all of the things that were going on with our brothers and sisters in the southern part of this continent, 
I just felt that this is what we, we need more of. And I guess that's why we have to go into the Valley of Unity. That which the Lord hath ordained as a sovereign remedy and the mightiest instrument for healing of all the world is a union of all of its people in one universal cause, one common faith. I'm sure that people have heard this, these beautiful quotes and I was just um, talking with some friends from BC who had climbed a mountain and thought that their, some of their people would be there to greet them, but they weren't. But when he said when he looked back, he, saw, he said he saw a Japanese woman with her husband who was a white man and he saw a black brother behind him and he understood more in a, in a sense of, it became more of a reality for him that this earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. Oh, what's going on here? There we go. Friends, this is, um, was of course last year when we could be in different communities. This was in Washot. And each of these youth with the elders were taking on the responsibility to uphold those things that we've been discussing, to be unified, to be full of love and grace. Of course, we've already talked about this, that justice is to attain unity. Bahala says, the light of man is justice. Quench it not with the contrary winds of oppression and tyranny. Because the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity amongst men. So friends, I, I'm recognizing the time and I'm going to read a few of these for contentment. Like what is contentment? You know, contentment is to see life as a perfecting process rather than a goal to reach. Maybe we could read the second quote, Jessica, and then I'll read the third one. Sure. Thank you. In words of wisdom, Baha'u'llah informs us, the source of all good is trust in God, submission unto his command, and contentment with his holy will and pleasure. The source of all glory is acceptance of whatsoever the Lord hath bestowed, and contentment with that which God hath ordained. Bahala says, O Son of Spirit, ask not of me that which we desire not for thee, then be content with what we have ordained for thy sake. For this is that which profiteth thee, if therewith thou dost content thyself. And in words of wisdom, Baha'u'llah says, the source of all glory is the acceptance of whatsoever the Lord hath bestowed and contentment with that which God hath ordained. I think that this is the prescription for those that are all stressed out. <laughs> if we can somehow calm ourselves and realize that we must be content so that we can move forward. It's not to say that we're not going to take care of ourselves and others. And this is how we should try to be. So we're moving into the valley of wonderment. I suppose we're looking back at those valleys and we're wondering, why couldn't I see that before? Why couldn't I see that simply by being more open to loving, to be more unified with the rest of humanity, the people around me, that this would bring about reconciliation on some level. So he talks to us about this valley of wonderment. The seeker is written, it is written, is struck dumb by the beauty of God. So we start to see in every living thing 
plants, animals, the earth itself, the sky, water, air, we start to see that everywhere is the beauty of God. The seeker becomes conscious of the vastness of the glory of creation, discovers the inner mysteries of God's revelation, being led from one mystery of creation to the next. It is explained that the seeker continues to be astonished by the works of God. So everything becomes a wonderment. Wonderful. <laughs> In this valley of wonderment, the seeker is tossed in the oceans of grandeur. Oops, went back. Come, come, come. It's not going backwards, so we'll just go forward. I would like to share this and to have people remember this when we are going forward and sharing this amazing world shaking message with the rest of humanity. And sometimes we feel that we are not able to do it. In the seven valleys, Bahala says, Dost thou reckon thyself only a puny form? when within thee, the universe is folded. So the next time we feel hesitant or afraid to do something or afraid to help somebody or afraid to step up and offer our service, remember this quote. And here's the last one. I... I took those spirit, uh, what I refer to as the um, spirit bowls uh, to the north. And they tried to, <laughs> they tried to decipher what they were. And um, the woman at the beginning, she said, oh, so we're, we were searching, we're trying to understand. And at the end, it was just, absolutely nothing <laughs> that blew my mind <laughs> so i suppose when we're looking for ways to to reconcile our differences to reconcile with our uh, enemies or reconcile with things that we don't know this is uh, this is a quote we can remember so jessica please read this one the valley of true poverty and absolute nothingness. Mm -hmm. The final valley is the valley of true poverty and absolute nothingness. And it is the furthermost state that the mystic can reach. The seeker is poor of all material things and is rich in spiritual attributes. This station is the dying from self and the living in God. The being poor in self and rich in the desired one. Poverty, as here referred to, signifieth being poor in the things of the created world, rich in the things of God's world. For when the true lover and devoted friend reacheth to the presence of the beloved, the sparkling beauty of the loved one and the fire of the lover's heart will kindle a blaze and burn away all veils and wrappings. Yea, all he hath, from heart to skin, will be set aflame, so that nothing will remain save the friend. I'm having a hard time to go forward. There we go. So friends, I think I would like to thank you so much for your patience. I like, I, I wish I could see all your beautiful faces, but I can't. But I'd like to offer this prayer uh, for all of us who are attempting 
to be out there to encourage unity, to encourage understanding amongst everybody that we are in association with, and to give thanks, give thanks to God, give thanks for everything that we are having to struggle with and are challenged with bringing about this reconciliation on the planet for all people. So I'd just like to offer this prayer. And again, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Oh God, my God, lowly, suppliant, and fallen on my face, I beseech thee with all the ardor of my invocation to pardon whosoever hath hurt me. Forgive him that hath conspired against me and offended me and wash away the misdeeds of them that have wrought injustice upon me. Vouchsafe unto them thy goodly gifts. Give them joy, relieve them from sorrow Grant them peace and prosperity. Give them thy bliss and pour upon them thy bounty. Thou art the powerful, the gracious, the help in peril, the self-subsisting. So in my language, I say Masi Cho. I wish you all a wonderful centenary year. 2021 is a very special year for the Baha'i world. And it certainly will have some implications for everybody else. This has been a hundred years since our beloved Abdul Baha has passed from this earthly world. And um, usually in a centenary like this, a lot of great things happen on the planet. So I wish you all well for 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, so appreciative. Seriously, your voice is, your, your spirit, I'm, I'm, I'm in a different state. So thank you for that. Um, it's interesting. We've got some some folks saying some interesting things. One per, one person is saying, "My thoughts circle around how to daily and with steadfastness embody our knowledge and understanding of the darkness of this day and the love with which we bring to the suffering." Not so much a question, um, but I, well, I guess it is kind of a question. Yes. It's a challenge. That's a challenge for all of us. And for us to become even more mindful. Because this is a special day. We started out with a quote about this being the most glorious of days. And we have this privilege. We have this honor of being alive in this day. To be able to witness to be able to witness all of humanity coming together for the betterment of the world. There's many people who are saying thank you. Um, it doesn't seem that we have any more questions, but a lot of gratitude. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, friends, I think that may be it for this. Well, look at that, 831, right on the dot. You are good with the timing. Oh, wait, we have a Q&A. We have so many. Oh, somebody wants to know how you became a Baha'i. If you want to talk about it, it is also 830. It's your decision. I'd love to share it because it brings, it brings into this, into this uh, space, the beautiful woman that taught me about Baha'u'llah. And her name is Shirley Lindstrom. I want to mention her name. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I lost my granny. She passed from this, this world to the spiritual world. And before she passed, 
she was very adamant with me and she said, I don't want you to ever be proud before God. <laughs> I'm only 11 years old, but I'm getting it. She said, you see your uncles, even your mother, they, they don't go to church. You don't have to go to church, she said, but if you're going there with your other, your friends, that's a good thing to do. She said, I don't want you to be proud before God. So when she passed, I thought to myself, what does she mean? What, what can I do? So she died in the spring, and that summer, there was a group of Baha'is that came from Alaska into the Yukon. And my friend, uh, who was eventually became my spiritual teacher, <clears throat> she was the one that invited them. But I should back up a little bit, because in our community, there were many Christian churches the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, and then the Fundamentalists. So there was four churches all believing in Jesus. And so uh, when the Baha'is came to town, there was a lot of gossip around town. The Baha'is. I love the sound of that. And being 11 years old, it's very curious. So I asked my mother, what is that Baha'ya? And she said, you never mind. Oh. Well, you don't tell that to an 11-year-old girl, especially as one as precocious as myself in those days, because I was the eldest in the family, so I had a lot of responsibility. So she said, you never mind. So... Every night, my mother, God bless her, she's still with us and she's struggling, but she's still well. Came from a family of 11. So we had a long table. <laughs> and um, my mother really inculcated into us that we should serve other people. We should go and help people, especially the aged and the poor. And so every day at dinner time, before we ate dinner, she used to say, okay, which one of my kids here helped somebody today? <laughs> so we were just kind of not competitive, but we were mindful. So this family of Baha'is had moved to Mayo and surely was really ostracized. And I remember uh, seeing her in the post office and she was so kind I didn't understand why people were talking bad about her and I went to pick up my mother's mail and she said you're so kind to help your mother I was shocked nobody ever said that I was kind <laughs> so she got her mail and uh her and her husband were quite impoverished. They had five children. He had moved to the little community so he could get work. And um, in our community, you could not, your dog is not supposed to run around at large. Otherwise, you'll get a big, you'll get a big fine. I knew they couldn't afford the fine. And I saw their dog running around. So I picked up the dog, remembering what my mother said, do something kind do some service. So I took the dog over to Shirley. And prior to that, that was a Sunday afternoon and trying to fulfill my grandmother's wishes, I had gone to the Catholic church where I could smell all the beautiful uh, incense. I went to the Baptist church because my girlfriend, she said, if you come with me, they'll give us a chocolate bar and we'll break it in half. It would be great. <laughs> And then to the Anglican Church, where they had Sunday school as well. And I love the crafts. They taught crafts there. So on my way home, I saw the Baha'i dog, who is a friendly little dog. And I realized that this family could not afford to pay the fine. So I picked up the dog, took the dog over to Shirley's, 
to discover that she was having children's classes late in the afternoon on a Sunday. And that was my first introduction to the Baha'i faith. When I came out of her house, my brother saw me and he knew that I was not supposed to be around the Baha'is. But when I was leaving Shirley's, she said, I really need help with all of these little children. I thought, well, I can help. She said, but you have to ask your mother first. I said, well, what do you teach? What, what is that about? She said, we teach that there is only one God. And Louise, as you know, she said to me, as you know, if there's only one God, then there's only one religion. And as you are fully aware, we're all human. So we're one people. <laughs> so this is how she taught me. Anyways, as I came out of her house to go home to help my mother prepare dinner, my brother saw me and I thought I was going to be scolded. But my mother asked the family who did something that day. And I said, I took the Bahia dog to the house. And she said, that's very good. I said, and she also has Sunday school classes. Can I go, mom? She said, what did they teach there? And of course, I talked about the onenesses. She said, of course you can go. So that's how I became Baha'i. <laughs> that's when the little spark was lit in my heart. And it, that was, so I was 11 and it wasn't really till 29. You know, I was about 29 years old that I really started to do my own search. And I had gone through all traditional teachings and learnings. I even dabbled a little bit in Buddhism, you know, trying to, I was searching. I searched for all of those years. So it was surely that actually at her fireside that I became Baha'i. There you go. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> so you know, we also, someone, um, Ed, who actually works here at Green Acre, he's watching, he shared um, about, apparently, according to Baha'ipedia Baha online, I would like to find the, 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 the original source, just so we know for sure. But J Jimmy Loft uh, actually saw Abdul Baha. <laughs> it's a very short story. I'll read it real quick. It says, um, from Baha'ipedia, in 1912, Abdul Baha took a journey to the West from Chicago that included a trip to Canada and through the Midwest with stops in a few cities. As he was leaving Canada on the way back to the States, he traveled through several villages. Perhaps most interesting is that the train passed through the town of Belleville, Belleville at 1.47 p.m., according to researcher Will C. Vanden Cunard. A four-year-old yes. Mohawk boy, Jimmy Loft, was sitting on a fence as the train passed. Abdul Baha took that moment to stand up and facing the window, smile and wave. Loft was so surprised he toppled off the fence. In May 1948, he became one of the first Native American Baha'is of Canada. Exactly, exactly. But there was nothing written about it in the States, right? Like, I, I, I forgot to tell you. Thank you. I'm so glad you shared that with everybody. Uh, <laughs> oh. The first time you saw People a picture. Saying, what, what's that? I said the first time he saw a photograph of um, uh, Abdul Baha, he said, I saw that guy before. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So we've got people th thanking you for sharing this story. She, Kristen Poise is so beautiful. And now I'm crying. Thanks so much for sharing that. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I hope this helps with the work that all of us have to do. Mm. And um, all in my prayers i don't know who you all are but thank you so much for coming and uh if you're if you're not a baha'i your friends are baha'is that's wonderful that is that's how that's how the faith grows that's how god planned it to be that we're each teachers of each other's hearts mm -hmm. I wish you all a good night thank you so much louise
And friends, if you are interested in attending more Greenacre programming, you can visit our website at greenacre.news and click on events and you'll see what's coming up. All right, have a great night, everyone. Thank you again so much, Louise. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.